Man, the Xenoblade 3 Special Edition situation really just was a complete mess, at least on the parts of specifically Nintendo of America and Europe. Australia, New Zealand, and Japan? Those regions got it fine. I don't really know what the issue with continents that specifically touched the Atlantic Ocean was, but it was an absolute disaster. I don't want this video to come off as me bragging about the fact that I got a special edition when so many other people who absolutely had the money and desire to get ones of their own weren't able to, and I hope that this video, which while it's not going to be comprehensive, and I don't even legally know if I could show every single page even if I wanted to, will at least fill some of the void and make some of the art book content accessible to people who weren't able to get one. If you're still interested in the special edition, have the money, and don't want to pay scalper prices, the Japanese My Nintendo Store exclusively has an option to buy just the special edition materials for a slight markup on the full special edition minus the price of just the game. So that is, you'll get the box, the steelbook, and the art book if you can manage to get it shipped from Japan to wherever you are. I do think it is going to be slightly lower quality than the North American Special Edition, as the NA version has a holographic box, both front and back, and a hardcover art book, and I believe the Japanese box is matte and the art book soft cover, but you could still get the stuff if you really want it, and I think that's the most important thing. You can argue as much as you want about whether Nintendo actually still deserves your money for this stuff after how badly they mishandled it, but I think we can all agree that the scalpers definitely don't deserve it, so this is probably your best option to still get one. If you're worried about the text being in a different language, basically the only thing with a significant amount of text on it is the letter from Tetsuya Takahashi, which I will absolutely be talking about in this video. All that being said, this video will contain spoilers for Xenoblade 1, 2, 3, Torna, and Future Connected, but not any of 3's DLC, as this art book predates any of its official releases, and let's get to it. That intro was very long, so I'm not going to give you a big call to action and just make you look at this specific screenshot I took of my YouTube studio the other day while I set up the next point I want to make. That point is that ultimately, this entire book is of concept art, which means the stuff that's in it does not necessarily reflect things that are canon to the final game. And I'm going to go as far as saying that as long as something is not directly represented exactly as it appears on page in Xenoblade 3, as you can play it right now, it should not be considered canon. Some of this stuff absolutely does come from previous drafts of the main story and from things that were scrapped and not put in the final game after deliberation. That doesn't mean all of it is. A lot of this stuff could very easily just be for a proof of concept, for pitching the game to Nintendo, or just as mood setter things, or a way to get certain ideas or concepts across to other Monolith employees as they were working on the game, and without anything saying what was from a scrapped concept and what was for something else, we have no way of knowing what stuff was intended to be in the game at some point and what never was. So to be on the safe side, do not consider anything that isn't the concept art for the final version of a design of something as it appears in the game itself as canon. I'm going to talk about the ideas behind a lot of things and what they could mean as if I was analyzing a game trailer or content in a final game, but while you're listening to me say stuff like that, remember that as long as I'm not explicitly saying that it is the final version of something, it's not actually canon to Xenoblade 3 as we have it now. The first page I actually want to talk about in specifics is the Tetsuya Takahashi letter on page 3, and as this goes up, I would like to give a major, major thank you to Twitter user at Zord Valley for making high quality scans of a lot of pages in the art book, making those scans public, linked to the Google Drive in the description, and for allowing me to use them in this video. They also do great art and occasionally have commissions open, so I will link their main Twitter in the description as well, so you can go check that stuff out, which I would highly recommend doing, especially if you like funny Krelly and Xenogears content. Oh, and lastly, if you see a picture that looks a lot worse than most of the other ones, that was probably one I took myself because I wanted to cover a page not included in the scans, and unlike those scans, I have an iPhone camera, a ceiling fan, and a copy of Photoshop Elements from 2010. Nothing I do is going to look nearly as good. And now, at last, we can start reading this Takahashi letter. Unlike the one he gave to Japanese fans in an email soon after the game released, this one does not really contain a lot of interesting content or tidbits, but it does confirm a few things, so I'm going to read certain excerpts from it and not the entire thing, though of course you can read it in your own art book or on screen or in the Google Drive. 
Takahashi mentions wanting the two nations to have very distinctive visual identities, and then confirms inspirations that I think most of us have been talking about ever since the game was first revealed. For Keves, we started off by designing Pharaonises that used Face Mechon as a motif. Their colors match with the black tones seen on Metal Face, and their soldiers' combat uniforms make use of the same colors. Additionally, we took the power frame from Shulk's outfit in Xenoblade Chronicles Future Connected game and used it as an accent on the soldiers' uniforms. The motif for the Agnes forces, on the other hand, uses white tones in a Japanese aesthetic seen in its Pharaonis designs and soldier uniforms. For its Pharaonises, we applied the mechanical design seen in the Xenoblade Chronicles 2 game to reinforce the contrast of the Agnes side with Keves. Finally, we wanted to make this mysterious third power different from the other two, so we created their visual design with an aesthetic sense closer to the real world for their clothing and weapons. He then says that the main party's main outfits looking so different from both 1 and 2 was intentional because they got their clothes from the Lost Numbers, which almost works except for the part where they don't dress like anyone from the city, which I don't really know what happened there. He also says that the expanse of scenery is a culmination of 1 and 2's worlds like with so much else about the game, and he also specifically says that he did not want to evoke deja vu or nostalgia, but give players a feeling of excitement and novelty upon stepping into the world. That's interesting because I didn't get that. I got a sense of, wow, everything seems wrong. This seems just not right with how we've seen these worlds in the past games. So I think it's interesting. And my takeaway was that there was something wrong about Ionios from the start, which ended up being correct once I finished the game, obviously. So I think it's kind of interesting that my big takeaway from the visual design of Three's world was apparently not what the developers were going for, but still something that worked really well with the themes and story of the game. Takahashi then talks about how most of the monsters are also from either one, two, or both, and they want people to look at the ecosystems they made, which is super interesting. And then also talks about how the character designs themselves were also supposed to be a culmination of the two worlds, and how he worked together with main character designer Masasuku Saito and Ouroboros by Koichi Mugitane, aka Choko, who has done things since Xenosaga. I think that's actually everything super interesting about this specific letter because it's a Xenoblade 3 thing. He really likes reiterating that it's a culmination of the series. Now remember, I'm going to be skipping over pages if there's not anything analysis worthy on them, so we're actually going to go past all of Noah's stuff to Noah's Ouroboros on page 13. If I skip over a large quantity of pages, that does not mean there isn't good or interesting art on there, that just means there isn't anything I specifically want to point out, so I would recommend, if you don't have your own book, to look through the Google Drive scans and see that art for yourself, because it's all fantastic. The thing I want to point out here is the picture of the back of the Ouroboros in the upper right hand corner. There are two other instances of the Ouroboros in the exact same pose with different effects on them to show how things fit together, but this one is completely colored and has its own background, which I think is kind of interesting because Basically, all the art in this book, by Choco or other artists, unless it's literally the environment itself, does not have a background. So, I think it's interesting that this one specific piece does. The place the Ouroboros is in doesn't really appear to be defined. It seems to sort of just be some sort of void with maybe water on the ground, what appears to be a partially cloudy sky, and either a building that's partially obscured or a blotchy ink thing rising up in the background. This doesn't really scream anything specific to me. It might have been some weird void where you fought at some point in the game's history, or it could just be there to properly contrast the various colors present on the Ouroboros form. Moving ahead only two pages this time, we get one of the few pages that we actually knew about way before the special edition came out, and that is the one of Mio's expressions and concept art, because here's where we see younger-looking long-haired Mio with a dress on, which obviously does not fit any of Mio's history in Ionios, and as such, is likely Mio as a regular kid, for whatever given value of regular you can get with that family, in the original Xenoblade 2 world, possibly from a scrapped version of the intro scene that, in addition to showing Noah, also showed things from her perspective. I've talked about this extensively on multiple occasions, so it's not really worth analyzing here, and in fact, the most interesting thing to me on this page is the sheet of eight Mio expressions. Now, an expression sheet for a character existing in the first place is not a very surprising thing. If you turn back a few pages through the ones I skipped, you'd see one for Noah as well. 
And whoever makes these Xenoblade art books really likes showing off the ones for the characters that Masatsuko Saito designed, as both Xenoblade 2 art books also included ones for those characters. The really weird thing about this one, though, is that it is dated October 2019, and Noah's is actually several months later as March 2020. These expression sheets are probably not the first instance of Saito drawing characters in their final design, they just happen to be the only ones with an explicit date on them, but I think it's very interesting that, first off, 3 was very far in development as in character designs were completely finalized well before Future Connected released, which is kind of interesting because it means that the plot probably wasn't completely finalized, so there are some things in Future Connected that are references to a version of Xenoblade 3 that no longer exists, but it also means that a lot of things definitely were intentional, like the one piece of Napan dialogue about people combining to become more powerful, or the name Future Connected in and of itself, which I am going to give them the benefit of the doubt and assume that they had actually written Melia's line from the final boss battle beforehand, liked the phrase Future Connected, and decided to put that as the name of the Melia expansion for Xenoblade 1 instead of doing things the other way around. Next, I want to talk about page 17 where we see a turnaround of Mio in her Offseer outfit, and this is mostly going to be putting a pin in it for later because we'll see later on that the concept art for the Agni and Offseer outfit was actually straight up based on this Mio stuff and not some generic Offseer NPC, and while there was concept art for Noah's Offseer outfit earlier on in his section, he did not seem to be the base for the idea of the Kavesi Offseer, it sort of seems like they used Chris for that instead. You'll also notice that Mio's core crystal appears to be a normal blade one and not a flesh eater one in the Offseer outfit turnaround, which is interesting because a few pages earlier there's a turnaround of her in her regular outfit, and that does have the Flesh Eater Core Crystal. This is slightly feeding into my conspiracy theory that Saito himself was not told every single plot detail, only what was necessary to design the characters, when he initially was given the commission to do this stuff for this game, and we'll see a bit more about that later. Moving on to page 18, we see concept art for Mio's Ouroboros, and Again, the thing with the background is the thing I want to talk about, because this is a very early design, as in, it doesn't resemble Cosmos whatsoever. Which is kind of insane, because every Xenoblade game that Saito works on that doesn't have Cosmos in it, he puts Cosmos in it in some way. Like, he did that for one of Fiora's outfits in Xenoblade 1, he did that for an outfit in Xenoblade X, that's a big spoiler, Cosmos herself is in 2, so that doesn't count. He added more outfits in Definitive Edition for Fiora that looked like other versions of Cosmos, and then Mio Zoroboros also obviously looks like her, and it turns out it didn't start out that way. We can also see a much more humanoid-looking face on the Ouroboros underneath the mask than we ever get to see in the finished game, so it's very possible that Ouroboros used to be a bit less robotic, I guess is the right term. They all look sort of non-organic in a way, and this sort of makes it look more like a tokusatsu costume than a mech, which is kind of interesting because there was also an unused concept from Xenoblade 2 that Takahashi brought up once, where he said that blades were conceptualized as being like 20 meters tall or something like that, so it's possible that the original concept for Ouroboros was closer to Ultraman than Xenogears. This art is also dated at January 31st, 2019, so there were Ouroboros designs in the works, almost a year before the character designs were finalized. And it makes sense that this Ouroboros design is nowhere near finalized because we don't know if regular Mio had been finalized at this point in time, and since it's much earlier in development, the actual role Ouroboros played in the story and how they functioned might have been different, so this design might have been for a different type of thing than the fusions we ended up getting. Moving on to Uni, I want to just very briefly look at page 22, because the way they have her just kind of smiling straight into the camera with one wing folded and one wing fully extended to properly detail both of those positions is just really charming and funny to me for some reason. Then on 23 we get her little turnaround thing, and this is interesting because as far as we can tell, this is the full body piece of her that directly precedes the final version that you can see on page 22 and obviously in the game itself, and her jacket is different. It's got more of a camo look to it, and has a symbol of a wing and a lightning bolt on the back. I think I might actually know why they changed it in this case, and that's because, as Takahashi mentioned before, the party gets their clothes from the Lost Numbers, and we've seen the Lost Numbers in the final game, they don't have any Hyentia among them. The wing symbol doesn't really make sense for them to have. 
Now, the camo jacket actually fits more along with city aesthetics than the final jacket, but I do think the final jacket fits more along with what the rest of the party has than what the NPCs have, and I think having cohesion amongst the party is much more important. Also, we can see that Uni's pants have these very, very cursed, almost sock things on them, and I don't know how to feel about that. On the next page, page 24, we get another version of this turnaround, this one dated as April 1st, 2020, that puts her in her final jacket, but instead of green, it's yellow, which I'm going to affectionately dub Banana Bird. And not really anything else to say about this, it looks like after they made the camo jacket, they decided to change design to the final design, and were workshopping colors before they finally settled on the green. The weird thing about all this is, in the datamined material that people have been able to dig up, there are non-final portraits for all of the party members, and that makes sense, they need placeholders, but both Unis and Lanzas actually use non-final versions of their outfits, which I think is kind of interesting. In fact, Unis isn't just the miscolored jacket, it's the camo jacket, so her design went through two separate iterations in between that placeholder getting put in and her design being completely finalized. On the next page, we get her expression sheet, which is dated June 2020, so about a month after Banana Bird. Don't really know where this is in relation to the jacket going from yellow to green, but I don't think it really matters. And we also get a couple pieces of her as a kid in a different outfit than we've seen her in before. This is not young Uni from the beginning of the game, where we see her in the original Xenoblade 1 world, and this is also not what Uni looks like in any of the flashbacks, so... Since young Noah also was wearing this exact outfit in his concept art, it's likely that the young Kavesi characters initially were going to be wearing this instead of a uniform. However, young Lanz is actually wearing a different outfit as well. There's nothing super noteworthy about Tyon. We get a turnaround of him, and the front-facing picture of that was also his placeholder portrait. That's the same for all of the party members. But if we go to page 33, we actually get something really cool, and that is... A guide for folding your own Mondo. They actually had to design how it would realistically be put together from actual paper, and I think it's kind of amazing that they went out of their way to do something like that. There's also a couple small images of Mondo playing around with each other, which is always nice and cute, and it makes them look a little bit more like Nopon, which I think is kind of funny. If we go ahead to page 35, we can see that the backside of Tyon's Ouroboros turnaround makes him look a lot more caked up than I think most of us realize just by playing through the game. Then page 36 just has a really nice piece of the entire Ouroboros, and 37 shows what that Ouroboros in Mondo mode looks like. Page 38 and 39 are a turnaround of Lens, and here is where we can see what I was talking about, where he also has a non-final design that was used as a placeholder portrait. It looks like, at some point, they decided to swap around which of his shirt and jacket was blue and which was grey, as we can see his shirt is a dark blue and his jacket is a darker grey, when those colors were swapped and also made a bit lighter for his final design. If we go to page 41, we can actually see Young Lands as well, and he's wearing the same blue muscle shirt the older version wears, which is weird because the other two Kavesi Kid concepts were wearing the exact same outfit, and then all three of them end up wearing the exact same outfit, at least within Ionios, in the final game. There's something about these pictures of Lens that I think you've probably been screaming at me ever since I got through Unis, because none of the concept art has the term marker on it. For the kids, you could make the argument that it's outside of Ionios, but for the adults, that is really, really weird. And we'll see later on when we go through other characters that no Kavesian Agnian characters designed by Saito have the term marker on them until you get to the final art of them used in-game, while most of the Kavesian Agnian heroes designed in-house by artists at Monolith Soft will have the marker in their concept art. So it seems like certain key plot elements, like the idea of terms and the mark that comes with it, weren't even given to Saito and were kept internal within Monolith Soft until relatively close to the game finishing development. And I think that's really interesting. Saito being a contractor is public knowledge, but it never really occurred to me that he might be given information on a need-to-know basis and not actually told everything about the game he's designing for. Anyway though, we can start looking at Senna's stuff on page 46. There is exactly one picture of her with a significantly smaller core crystal, and then basically every other concept image uses a larger one, so 
this might have just been a mistake and not even an intentional previous design. On page 47, we can see part of her turnaround with her not wearing pants for some reason, which is weird because this didn't happen to any other character and she never takes them off in the game, so I guess it was just to show where the ether lines go because that's what they did with a lot of Blades in 2. Just kind of weird, I guess. Not really anything else to say there. And then on page 49, we can see her expression sheet. This is also from June of 2020. Not super interesting. I just think the one in the top left corner is adorable and very no thoughts head empty, which is very fitting for Senna as a character, but would you really have her any other way? Oh, also, despite nobody in the expressions ever wearing a shirt, Mio and Senna do not have their core crystals, despite these designs being dated obviously after them being Blades was originally thought of. That does not seem to have been a mistake, just not including unnecessary detail for a set of images that were obviously supposed to focus on the face and how the character emotes. Skipping Senna's Ouroboros as well, we can start with the heroes, beginning on page 54 with Riku and Manana. There's not a lot of art of them, but I just love Manana's expression here, and I think the fact that they actually had an image without the wings present to show what they looked like without them and what their clothes looked like underneath that is incredibly cursed. Across from them, we have Zeon on page 55. Again, not a lot of art specifically of him and doesn't show off a lot that we didn't already know. I just think the one where he's facing directly into the camera doing the Danganronpa pose is extremely intimidating. Then page 56 brings us back into the Saito zone with Ethel, where we can see a few unfinished versions of her design, again without the term mark present, and one where even as an adult, she is wearing something resembling the generic Kavesi uniform as opposed to the much more unique one, so it's very possible that that specific design actually predates the concept of heroes or the idea of her being one. She also gets an expression sheet, and the middle three are giving me some very strong Tyrea adjacent feelings, so I wasn't really on board with the Ethel train for most of the game's history, but I kinda get it now. Across from Ethel, we of course have Kamaravi, and while we do get a couple expressions he doesn't really make in-game, unfortunately, there isn't as much unused stuff for him as there was for Ethel. The only real thing is one bust shot of him seeming to wear a cloak that he does not have in the game. Monica and Gondor are on pages 58 and 59 respectively. Gondor's expressions are dated September 2020, so it's likely that Monica also came after the party members. And we can see that despite her final official art giving her her eye patch on the left eye, there's also a concept piece of her with it on her right eye, and all the rest of the art on this page has her without it whatsoever. So while he clearly didn't know about the term marks, it at least seems like Saito was told about how the eye patches for the lost numbers worked, at some point in time, he might have not been given all the details until later as well. I do think it's interesting that Monica has art of her with her eye patch, but Gondor does not. What she does have is an unused accessory like Kamaravi, in this case, a pair of goggles around her neck, and I refer to them as the obligatory shonen protagonist goggles, and I have to say I'm not that far off. Gondor is probably the most typical shonen protag, besides arguably like Senna, out of all of the important characters in Xenoblade 3, and I've given my spiel about how I want her reincarnation to be the main character of Xenoblade 4 before, so I think it's kind of interesting that she used to have those, but didn't for some reason or another. I'm sort of thinking that since we do see her piloting a mech at a couple points, that she'd be wearing those as pilot goggles while doing that, and they decided to scrap that because she's only in one for a couple scenes, and it wasn't worth modeling something that would be on her and need to have physics the entire rest of the time, especially since she also wears the Cloud Keep key around her neck as a pendant, and that would be blocking that. On the next page is Shania, and the most important thing about all of this is she has complete official artwork. A lot of other characters do not have this. The only ones who do are the party members, the heroes, Guernica, a couple of the most important consoles, and then three characters who don't fit any of those molds. The other two characters are also two of the three characters that have hints of them being a scrapped hero in the data mine, and the third one of those is Mwamba, who is literally a hero for a temporary period of time. So it's possible that if we do get free heroes, Shania could be a fourth contender. This is of course made slightly more likely by the fact that she does have access to a weapon we don't see anywhere else in the game, that of course being her sister's gun. I do know I said that prominent Mobius got full art, and she is a member of Mobius, 
But the part where she's actually doing Mobius things is in a side story, not even the main story, though that admittedly could have been moved to side story at some point in development. And she's not with the other Mobius. Sure, spoilers, but there's also a spoiler section showing stuff like the Queen's N and M in the back of the book, and they could have put her there if they really wanted to. Instead, she is in between Gondor and Isard, both of whom, I don't think I need to tell you, do end up being heroes. So, I feel like, even if she's never actually added to the game, she might have been a hero that you could have temporarily with you and would go away when she betrays the party, sort of like when Ethel leaves and all that stuff happens, or she just was never initially supposed to betray the party at all and be a hero at the whole time. As I said, Isard is next on page 61. The only really interesting thing is that there's one bust shot of him where he somehow looks even more tired than he does in the final game, and when I tweeted this out, someone made another Germa joke, so okay. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of Miyabi, which means that since Valdi also has two pieces of Mecha Friend on his page, one piece of him actually moves over onto hers, and we can see his term mark obviously visible in concept art here. Although, that's I guess kind of subverted, because the other time we see his right shoulder, it's not there, but at the very least we can tell that the in-house monolith artists did know that these characters were supposed to have term marks on them. As for Teach and Alexandria on the next page, the only important thing about them is the fact that there's no zoom in on either of their core crystals despite both of them having them. Obviously Teach's is much more conspicuous because it's on his face and Alex's is mostly covered up by her clothes, but I think it's weird that they didn't show a specific detailing of them for the modelers to get them exactly as is. Obviously, the two pieces of each character before the final ones are not the only concept art made for those characters, and it's likely that if this game does get a second art book post DLC, we will see more of it, but I do think it's interesting they chose not to show those highlights in this book. On the other hand, someone who does have their core crystal visible is Juniper, and we can see in the concept art of them from the back that it's actually differently shaped than it is in the final game, being more of an arrowhead than a triangle. Their term mark is also very clearly visible, and we get not one, but two different expressions, both of which are extremely adorable. Need I say more? Who could have possibly guessed that I have a soft spot for the fluffy green character? Next up is Ashira, and I don't really think it's super significant, but I think her face structure did change slightly in between concept art and final design. Concept art Grey looks significantly less like an aged up Alpharad than the final version of him does. After him is Fiona, where we can see that Sigiri has also started invading her personal space, likely because the Pharon in her official art is so large, despite there not actually being concept art of it in this section. But unlike Miyabi, we actually get several pictures of her, including one very glorious, even less thoughts, even emptier head than Senna right above her bag. Also, we can see, again, her term mark is clearly visible in concept art. The same is also true for the rest of the Sigiri stuff on the next page, where we can see that they even swept aside her bangs to show exactly where it is. This is visible in-game, but you need to do some tricks with the camera. I just think it's really neat that they actually went out of their way to explicitly show, yeah, that's where this is. We're not copping out and just saying, okay, yeah, this character's term mark is under their clothes somewhere. We're going to have a place for it and even put it on the model, even if it's hard to see. Also, Sigiri is also cute. Why are the characters I like just because they're cute? Always garbage in battle. It is the Luxon curse, truly. Skipping some lost number stuff to page 72, we get the most legendary page in the entire art book because it's Mwamba and Boliaris at the same time. I don't think I can even take this. Unfortunately though, Mwamba does not have finished full body art. Now there is a full body piece of him here and it is mostly fully rendered, but his head is not. It's actually taken from the zoom in of his head that we can see to the right, so it's very possible that Mwamba being a full hero of some sort was scrapped, and that ended up with them not actually finishing his full body art. Boliaris doesn't even get that far, but we do get one very suave looking sketch of his head, so it's at least something. I wouldn't put too much stock in this, but Boliaris is also sandwiched between two of the three data mined potential heroes, so maybe he was considered for the job at 1.2 despite having a generic weapon type. Across from them, we have Yurin, who has complete, full, finished Saito art. And we know as a fact this is finished because it has the term marker on it. There's also a bunch of expressions of his and an unused outfit. His full art is also him in his Kavesi soldier uniform. And 
not in his Mobius outfit without the helmet, which I think is extremely interesting, and I think very highly suggests the possibility of him being a scrapped or future hero. Ignoring the Garvel half of the next page, we have Chris, and there's not really a lot to be said here, but I think it's kind of interesting that the power frame belt he's wearing looks to be fully rendered, while the rest of his body isn't, and it even appears to be a different resolution, so that power frame must have come from some other piece of art, which I think is kind of neat. I don't know why. Similar to Boliaris, these two also have the distinction of being sandwiched between Yorin and another one of the Datamind unused heroes, again potentially suggesting that they may have filled the role at some point too. The fact that Garvel is also present in the flashbacks where Yorin dies and the party is rescued by Ethel suggests that that portion may have actually been playable with the young versions of the main Kavesi trio and then also Yorin and Garvel as additional party members. I'm not sure where Chris would have fit in there because he seems to have been met by Noah long after that and wouldn't be the age we see him in this concept art here anyway, but there may have been another Noah flashback that he was in too. Then on page 75, we have full body, complete, fully rendered art of Nimue. Exact same thing for her I said for Yorin, only difference is that her term marker is not visible, so maybe there's wiggle room about it not being complete finalized art, but if you compare it to other Saito concept art and other Saito complete official art, you know that it is. Skipping over Triton's page to Consul D, we can actually see that he has official art of him without his mask on. The art of him with it on had been shared pre-release because he was the one member of Mobius that they were actually advertising a lot beforehand. So the fact that there's also a version of that where he's not wearing the helmet I think is interesting at the very least. Again, like with every Saito character that gets expressions, there are a few that end up unused in game. Then skipping over O and P, we get consoles Y and L both together on page 79. And that's really weird because if you've done all the side stories, you know that Consul L has zero lines of dialogue and appears exclusively in Mobius form, and yet we can see them in their armor here. This means that we can actually backsolve, and whenever we see that armor in a cutscene, it actually means that was L the entire time. I believe they show up at least once in various Mobius related stuff. And this armor design was also used as half of the ones that Zed summons in the amphitheater when you're fighting him. Next is Zed, including finalized, fully rendered art. I just think it's interesting that he's actually in here and not in the spoiler section since N and M are in there, but I guess since Zed was shown off kinda a lot in the direct, it's not really a spoiler to know that he exists and what he looks like. The rest of the stuff about him we find out is the spoiler. Skipping over a few minor consoles, we get even more minor consoles, because on page 84 we can see console E of Colony Iota, and on page 85, Consul F of Colony Zero without their helmets, something that's not seen at all in-game. They don't particularly look like each other, and they're very generic looking, much more so than any of the other consoles we see unmasked throughout the game, so there's not really a lot to say about this other than maybe we would have seen more of them unmasked in a previous version of the game. On the next page, we also get Consul B from Colony 9 and Consul I from Colony New. And the weird thing about that is, we never see Irma in her console armor. This helmet is visible in a little hideaway cave that you can access with Fiona's Ascension quest, so we knew what Irma's helmet looked like, but there's actual full art of her wearing the entire armor despite that not being a thing that happens at all during the game. However, this armor design is actually the second one Zed summons into the amphitheater during his boss fight, so it does not technically go unused. The next few pages are designs for various members of the armies of the two nations, and it's sort of interesting because you can see a couple finalized NPC designs, like Boliaris and Sigrun are both there from Keves, but also a lot of generic designs and designs that you could make up using the elements of NPC models from the final game, but as far as I know, don't actually show up in that exact configuration. And you can also sort of see how some things like racial traits and accessories were viewed in a kind of modular sense where they were giving some things to some NPCs, some things to others, some of them get nothing, some of them get everything, stuff like that. Unfortunately, Sigrun is the only Hyantia NPC that appears in basically her final design, so actual best girl Olashandra does not have any official art. This is why we need to get a second Xenoblade 3 art book. Sprinkled in with all this NPC stuff is a small look at a past version of weapons in Ionios, as 
This is very conspicuous on page 90, because there's three different outfits where it's the same character in the same pose holding the same weapon. They appear to just be regular metal weapons, and there's no blue glow on them whatsoever. As far as we can see, at least, there's no clock symbol on them whatsoever, and they really just look like a standard metal sword that you could see in any fantasy or sci-fi thing that has that kind of weapon. So, it's possible that the idea of the Xenoblade 1 nation and the Xenoblade 2 nation fighting each other long predates things like the flame clock, blades, and the iris. On page 93, we can see what I think is an unused outfit, where there's what appears to be a Homs guy in something very resembling High Entia armor from Xenoblade 1, so it's possible that Melia was going to carry over a little bit more from her past culture into whatever little bit of the beginning of Keves she was able to influence before she got kidnapped. Also below that guy, there's another outfit that I think is used but I'm also not entirely sure on. What's not in this concept art at all though is anything related to Kavesi Offseers, which is kind of weird, but I guess they must have gotten all the stuff they needed from Noah and Chris. This is in direct contrast to their counterparts though, as the very next page includes Mio just right there being the model for the female Agony and Offseer design. Even funnier, right next to her they have a male Gormati with a similar height and hair color to model the male version of the outfit, which I don't even know if that's a joke. They could have chosen any male Agnian Offseer in the game, and there are several, to model it next to Mio, but I guess they went with the one superficially similar to her. I don't even know if that was intentional, but it made me chuckle a bit. On page 96, we can see more traditional metal weapons, this time in the hands of Agnian soldiers, again, in designs that are basically unchanged in the final game. This one's a bit more of a meat cleavery sword. I honestly have to say, these weapons are kind of out of place in any Xenoblade game. They don't even match the regular metal weapons in Xenoblade 2, the ones that non-drivers use, let alone the wacky defense force weapons we see in Xenoblade 1, and even Noah's training sword in 3. These weapons are probably the most clashing with any of the Xenoblade games that we have seen in this entire art book so far. On page 97, we can see close to best girl, but not quite best girl, Suna, in her basically complete final design, which is neat. I'm aware, I just like that hairstyle. It is the same one Olashandra has, but I'm not going to be ashamed at having a type. But anyway, there's a couple more pages of Agni and people, then it moves on to the lost numbers. On page 101, we can see the doctor and generic man who appears to have a just very realistic looking rifle for some reason. Then, I think it's really neat. I don't even know why. It just kind of looks cool to me. Pages 104 and 105, we have just a gallery of different face designs of people from all different ages and appearances, which I think is neat because this is the only place where the true face of humanity can be seen. That's like kind of the point of the city. So I like the fact that there's just a big two page spread of all of this stuff. And again, this is largely visible on 104. We can see pretty generic looking weapons. There's just a typical looking fantasy sword and a typical looking fantasy axe, all made of metal with nothing glowing whatsoever. These could very easily be placeholders for the more elaborate weapon designs being created, or just Xenoblade 3 was not supposed to have elaborate glowy weapons besides Lucky 7, and it was just going to have everyone with classic traditional metal weapons, which I think would be a neat thing to have because 3 is the only numbered Xenoblade game that is very upfront about being sci-fi and doesn't pretend to be fantasy for the beginning bit like both 1 and 2 do, so contrasting that with people using fairly grounded by anime standards weapons I think would have been a neat thing to do, but ultimately I'm glad they went with the blades they did. Unfortunately, they only provided two pages of Napon, but on 106 we can see one of the most glorious colon threes I have seen in my entire life. The next section is all about the enemies, and unfortunately most of the art here is just concepts of stuff in its final designs. Most likely this was the stuff given to the modelers that they would directly make the models out of, but I am going to stop on the Atil page because, yes, they did draw it doing the otter thing, so I'm going to show you it doing the otter thing because I'm not a monster. There's also like a dozen pages just of Levnesses, and if you're interested in mechanical design, you should absolutely track that stuff down and check it out. However, there's not really a lot to talk about there. What does combine mechanical stuff and things for me to talk about is the following colony section, which opens right up with something very important on page 136. This is the beginning of the bit of the book that covers locations and environments, so we're seeing backgrounds again, and that's not a big surprise. Neither is the fact that the first thing they showed off in the colony section is a nearly complete design of Colony 9, this one without any of the buildings present and in a mostly blank desert. But what I think is very intriguing 
is the flame clock in the Pharonis' mouth. Not only is the entire thing lit up, but it's actually two colors, sort of like the ones we see in the Queen's Thrones. Except, instead of using the actual Keves and Agnes colors, it's a blue, not the same blue as the final Keves, on the left side, and red on the right side. And the interesting thing is, most of the Pharonises in this section, be they beta versions of final designs that did make it into the game, or ones that were not used, look like this. So, it seems like, even if this design was a placeholder, it was one that was used in art for a very long period of development. There's also a silhouette of a humanoid figure there on the ground for scale, and while you can't really make out any details on this page, if you move over to page 138, which starts the double page spread for Colony 4, we can see two figures that actually have some detail to them, namely the fact that they are different heights and appear to be carrying different weapons. The character on the left in this image appears to have a gun slung over their back, and the character on the right has another nondescript weapon. I can't really tell what it is, it could be a sword or another gun, but rest assured, we are going to see zoom-ins on a lot of silhouettes of beta character designs or placeholder character designs later on in this section. This is just the first instance of it. I also think the Colony 4 depicted here is slightly larger than the one in the final game, though not to a very large amount, and that's going to be another running theme going forwards. A lot of the concept art colonies are significantly larger than we see them in the final game, which is most likely a technical and good game design limitation, and not them intentionally downscaling on their idea in the scale of Ionios. Also, on the other page of Colony 4, we can see what the Pharaonis looks like standing up, which we don't actually see in-game, so that's kind of neat. Skipping ahead to page 142, which covers both Colonies 11 and 15, we can see the Colony 11 art, which must have been way further on in development than a lot of the other stuff we're going to see throughout this video, as it actually has near-final, if not final, designs for Noah, Lands, Uni, and Tyon all present for scale. And if you look, you can see the sword in the background, and you can see a lot of other things indicative of the Keves Castle region, so it seems like this piece of art, and possibly this Pharaonis design, was created fairly recently, all things considered, so I think there's a distinct possibility that they knew they wanted to put a colony in that place, and they had the general idea of it and the hero you'd get from it set in stone, but they didn't know exactly what the layout was going to be and what the Pharaonis would look like until later, which is why we have concept Pharaonises with final party member designs. Across from them, on page 143, we have generic Keves colonies, which are things we see from both nations a couple times throughout the story, where they want to depict older colonies that had been destroyed, places that party members might have been from or fought against, or just the Pharaonis hulks you see destroyed out in the world somewhere, and they fall back on a couple generic colony designs for each nation, the most prominent of which, I think, is the very turtle-shaped Zord-reminiscent one from Keves, which we can see a pretty complete picture of in the lower right-hand corner, and this is sort of the most complete look at a colony like this we see, as in the actual game, the only extant one that uses this design that I can remember is shown being attacked during the final boss fight. We're again sort of easing into the whole concept Pharaonis is our bigger thing here, because while the amount of buildings present at this colony are roughly the same with even a larger one in the final game, the Pharaonis itself is much larger, and if, like Colony 4, you were able to go inside it and see rooms and do stuff and interact with NPCs in there, there will be a lot more room than basically any other colony we see in the final game. And there's even a little lookout tower on its right shoulder that I guarantee you'd be able to get to, and it would either be a secret area or a way to get some treasure or big quest. Moving ahead to Colony Lambda on page 146, we see another near-final design, and this one is actually in the correct context, because, as far as I can tell, that's a very Gaussian blurred Great Kate Falls in the background. Again, the most different from the final design thing there is the flame clock, as this one appears to be something very closely resembling the final clock design, inset in a circle that's half black and half white, and we'll see a little bit later in some of the other Agnian colonies that they also just use white as a shorthand for the actual light green energy that's in the Agnian flame clock, so I think in this case it's just an extremely off-model version of the final clock. On page 148, we get both colonies Iota and Mew, and this is our first real instance of a Pharaonis being much, much larger. Iota, again, barring the white flame clock, looks virtually identical to how it does in the final game, but Mew has, like, octopus arm tentacle things coming out of it, and it appears to not be inset on an island like it is in the final game and a lot closer to Agnes Castle on the Bionis head, and it honestly looks 
a lot like a Leftherian island in and of itself, and if you've been to the islands that are clearly from Leftheria in Arithia Sea, you'd know that those are a bit bigger than the final version of Emu Faranus, so it looks like in this version of the colony, the Faranus itself would be above all of the buildings. Skipping a page of Kamaravi's Faranus from the flashback, which confirms something that I believe is stated in-game that his colony originally was Colony Delta, we get to Colony Gamma. So I would like to introduce you to the absolute legend that is Wide Gamma in all of its Chungus-esque glory, because this thing is legitimately twice as wide as the final version, and has a veritable city underneath it. Again, there are several possibilities for why these concept colonies are bigger. They could have initially wanted a smaller number of larger ones instead of a larger number of smaller ones. They could have just been drawing them as they are in canon, as opposed to the smaller ones needed for gameplay convenience, because too many big towns just makes it a chore to go around and actually talk to NPCs and get places, or they just actually shrunk them at some point in time. But I'd say the most important part about this, besides the neat tiered rice paddy looking thing in front of it that is really reminiscent of Fonzamima, is, I don't know, the Zohar underneath the flame clock? It kind of seems like an important thing. Interestingly, its color is very reminiscent of the Numa Aegis Core, which gives it the unintended consequence of looking even more like an artifice from Xenoblade 2 than before, as that's the color used on all of the artifices except Malos's throughout the entirety of Xenoblade 2. Obviously, we already knew the general aesthetic for Agni and Levnus's and Pharaonis's came in part from the artifices. This just makes the connection a whole lot stronger. And even more interestingly, this is not the only removed Zohar on a colony we have seen, as the Colony 4 Faranus in one of the early trailers also has a Zohar symbol underneath the flame clock, but that one appeared to be metal and not glowing, and also much more resembled even in shape the Xenosaga version of the Zohar, as opposed to an Aegis Core or the Conduit from Xenoblade 2. So what I think happened is they wanted a Zohar symbol on Faranus's at some point, they changed it from resembling the Conduit, because that would be weird because then even the Kavesi ones would resemble something from Xenoblade 2, and that wouldn't fit. So they changed it to look like the Saga one, and then, at some point, really late in development, they decided to take that reference out for whatever reason, either to put it in DLC, or because they did not want as many Gears and Saga references, because that would make it less accessible to someone who just started with the Xenoblade series. And much, much later on in the video, we'll get to other instances of that where, at least in that case, I think it was a very good idea for them to remove the Gears and Saga references, as awesome as they would be. Going past a couple other Agnian colonies and Gilgamesh, we get to the part where there's legitimately no way they could accurately represent any of this stuff in-game, even on something more powerful than the Switch, and we just get to see the concept artists completely popping off, because a lot of these are just straight up gorgeous. Page 155 is largely taken up by different variations on the snake concept initially used for Colony 11, but so many times larger. There's even two Agnian versions, one of which is made out of just a bunch of different plates that are interlinked together, heh and it snakes around a giant mountain that's all built up and has this almost observatory-looking building on the top of it. Then there's a much more traditional serpent-looking thing that weaves its way through a bunch of floating islands that, instead of being dead and more Ardeni like the hovering reefs around Keves Castle, are actually green and built up and stuff. Then there's just a gigantic Kevesi snake that goes all the way into the clouds. And then if you turn the page to 156, we get just a straight-up dozen more designs, most of which aren't even partially used in-game. There's the thing hanging off of the cliff, there's the Kavesi one with grass growing over it, there's an Agnian one that sort of looks like Colony Sigma but in the clouds, there's a Kavesi one that looks just like Shavat from Xenogears, there's then the Kavesi one to the right of it that just looks like a giant four-fingered hand on top of a hill, there's a fortress blocking a waterfall, there's another Zord-looking one, there's one that's sort of bridging the cliff between two of the big Gower Plains hills, there's a mole, there's a beta-looking Colony 30 thing hanging underneath of something that sort of looks like a bat. Then on the page after that, we've got Colony Iota in a very bionis leg-looking area. There's another Kavesi snake. There's another arm thing, this one in Arithia. There's one in a noctum looking forest. And then there's another Beta Colony 4, and I love all of them. Trust me, that high is not going to go away anytime soon, because now we're in the location section. Even page 160, the first of this, is an absolute banger this time showing the Orion Mountains in all of their glory. There's no sword to be seen here, it's probably just omitted for the sake of clarity, and Araya looks a bit more blown up here than it does in the final game, but that just makes it even more impactful, especially given the actual painting style and how it goes along well with the little wispy clouds. 
And then there's just Colony 4 in the foreground showing just how massive this world is that ties it all together. The next page is also gorgeous, this time showing off things a lot more reminiscent of final environments we can see in the game. And we get on to the contentious topic of the scale figures used in these environmental images. On page 161, only two of the images have them, because the third is Colony 4 from the air, so can't really put a figure in there. And both of the ones that do have a figure just use Noah. In most cases, we are going to see either a silhouette of Noah, probably prior to his final design being done, or a render of Noah himself. But there are a lot of other cases where they use a completely nondescript silhouette, which probably indicates that these were even further back in development before they even knew Noah was going to be a ripoff of Fei Fang Wang. And even more interestingly, there are some times where they use a distinct character design, but it doesn't remotely resemble any actual Xenoblade 3 characters, and I'm going to point out a lot of occasions where that last case happens. Page 162 is just Great Kate Falls, so not a lot interesting there, but then 163, we get a settlement that we don't see anything even resembling in the final game. It's a mostly run-down looking place with a lot of city-esque architecture, but this appears to not be in the final city, as it seems to be under a little bit of Mechanis looking stuff, but not the sword, like actually part of the Mechanis itself, and is mostly open air. Like, there's a bit of a metal dome over it, partially protecting it from the weather, but other than that, it's in the open air. And I think this is a very, very early draft of the city, but the fact that it doesn't appear to be hiding out is very interesting, and if the DLC is a prequel where we see the first city, which was obviously a lot less hidden, I feel like they will go back to the well of stuff like this. As for the character silhouettes, this is our first real indication of ones using completely foreign designs to us, as in the bottom middle we see a figure that appears to have two swords slung over their back. This figure looks absolutely nothing like Final Ethel, who is obviously the one most associated with having two swords pre-Eno being a thing, and the profile of these two swords doesn't remotely resemble her sabers, so this is probably not even a predecessor. A little bit to the right and a little bit closer to the viewer than the two sword person, there is another white blob that I'm going to say might be another figure, but it's very, very hard to tell as is. And on top of them, closer to the building, is someone who appears to be holding a gun. Back in the middle of the little enclosure thing, directly underneath the hole on the metal bit on top, is what sort of looks like a final game city transport ship, complete with a ladder coming down from it. In front of that ladder, next to what might be crates or a smaller vehicle coming out of it, are a couple more figures that don't really have a lot of detail to them, but on top of the ship are two more, and these ones are super interesting, as one appears to be holding a light blue glowing spear, and the other appears to be holding an orange glowing sword. And this appears to be the oldest occurrence of the Keves and Agnes weapon glow, even if this is not the actual context for what these weapons originally were. And these characters, the two sword character and the gun character, are actually going to show up several other times, so it's very likely that they are beta versions of the party members. We are unfortunately going to need to skip over several pages of environments that look amazing, but are very, very close to how they look in the final game, though I am going to point out two things on page 164. In the top left corner, we see a frozen watery area, and then in the middle right, we see a much more colorful version of Capricorn Peak. Then we get to the just amazing looking stuff. I'm running out of adjectives because page 168 is Erythia Sea. And Erythia Sea is already a very beautiful area and we've seen parts of it already and we'll see more past that. But this is just extremely striking in its sense of scale and kind of loneliness in general. Because this version, it does look to be built out of both Erith Sea and Leftheria, Except it has something vaguely resembling Keveth Castle instead of Agnes. And then on the right side... There's a bridge, just a small bridge to nowhere off the edge of the world, and this version of the world appears to be even less friendly looking than Ionios because the pit underneath the sea is dark. At least in the final game, we can see there's another sea underneath this. Ionios is in basically a little hole in the middle of something vaguely resembling the endless sea from Xenoblade 1. In this case, it looks like the world is just over a giant pit, and... There's a bridge leading off the end of the world to somewhere we can only dream of because, well, in the final game, Ionios is more or less one contiguous landmass, and we can see that there is nowhere remotely close enough for a bridge to lead. And just that tiny little bit of something that 
might have just been thrown in there on a whim by some random environmental designer is so fascinating and gives so many ideas that I don't think I will ever be able to properly express all of the things this picture makes me feel and all of the concepts it brings to mind for other things set either in Ionios or another similar world, even outside of the framework of being a Xena thing. Slightly less interesting, but still worth pointing out on 169, is another shot of Arithia Sea. This one does have the correct Agnes Castle, but it actually has OG Aerith Sea floating reefs in it, which is kind of interesting because, well, even actual Melia Antiqua has to make do with bits of the more ordained Titan. And we saw Future Connected, and we already knew most of the floating islands were gone. Bionis Shoulder was just one big landmass made out of the same stuff as them, so... Dana Desert existing notwithstanding, this would actually almost be a plot hole if they did have those there. Page 170 is what, as far as I can tell, is an extremely old, much flatter version of Milk Meadows, with an extremely striking feature, and that is, of course, the gigantic Pharaonis. Like, that's castle-sized, and as far as I can tell, that's just a regular bit of Pharaonis wreckage. Judging by what almost looks like a joint on the right, it could be one Makanis finger, but the rest of it doesn't really match up with Xenoblade 1, so I think it's actually just part of a massive Pharaonis, which... That's already staggering, but uh, also if you look at that little outcropping in the lower left hand corner, those are four designs that we've never seen before, and I'm not going to talk about them yet because we're going to see two more designs alongside those in a minute. Coming down slightly with the stuff on page 171, these are environments that I don't think are remotely used at all in the final game, and one of them has actual Noah in it, and that's kind of the last we're going to see of actual Xenoblade 3 characters for a bit, because Trust me, I've got a lot to talk about the next page, because 172 is where the nuts I put in the title of this video really starts to hit, because we've got six characters facing down a massive four-legged Pharaonis, even bigger than a divine beast from Breath of the Wild. The right half of the page is taken up by this unused concept of the bust of Morardane completely detached from the rest of the body and decaying, folding above what appears to be the crystals from Valak Mountain, with snow on its head and the volcano on its shoulder still erupting, but who cares about that? There are six unused character designs in the picture on the left. From left to right, we have a Hyantia with light blonde hair and what appears to be a long staff or a gun. A short guy with a jacket and what appears to be a fairly realistic looking rifle. Then a tall looking woman with silver hair and a long spear with two ends. A guy who looks surprisingly like the older Rex we see in the image at the end of the game, with the Monado Rex, may I add. Then someone with another gun looking thing and what appears to be something sort of similar to Guernica's Pompadour. And a short girl with a large weapon. Before I speak up, I'm going to stress that we have no way of knowing for sure what these characters were used for, but what I can say for certain is that these are not the founders. On multiple platforms, the most popular post sharing this image that I have seen has referred to these characters as the founders with zero supporting evidence because, of course, none exists. These are not the founders. If the founders are later shown to look exactly like these characters, then that's an instance of them reusing the designs, and not these designs initially being for the Founders. First off, we vaguely know what four of the Founders look like because of the statues, and uh, this ain't them. We'll even see concept art of three of the Founder statues later, and none of those match up with any of these characters. While yes, only four of the designs are actually known, and two are hidden behind the Mentor statues, there is no High Entia in any of those statues, so that's already a potential issue, and there's no Gormadi in this group when, well, we know that there was a Gormadi in the Founders. Two of the Founder statues very closely resemble Noah and Mio because they were descendants of previous incarnations of Noah and Mio, and none of these characters actually look like either of them. With that all being said, I do obviously think this is a very, very early draft of the actual main game party of six, because despite them not remotely resembling them, there is a lot tying each of these characters to one of the final party members. From left to right, again, we have obviously Uni. Light-haired, high Entia, similar hair length, similar posing, and also with a long weapon that could very easily be a staff. These characters are in the Ouroboros pairs already. The one next to Uni is clearly Tyon, 
somewhat similar hair. Obviously, build is a lot different, but this character carries a gun, which is very similar to the generic Agnes guns that a lot of generic Agnes soldiers have, and Tyon uses a long-ranged weapon. In Xenoblade 1, Charla was a healer with a gun, so it is very likely that one of the healers in Xenoblade 3 would also carry a gun. Then to the right of that, we have probably the most different character, because the only real thing tying this woman to Mio is the silver hair. However, the spear is also a very agile weapon a lot of times in video games, and we already know that Mio's entire thing is being a dodge tank. Plus, it has blades on both ends, so that would lend to a lot of dual strike type fighting, which we obviously know Final Mio is adept at. To the right of that, we have a guy with a Monado. That's obviously male lead in a Xenoblade game, so this evolved into Noah. Then to the right of that, we have tall, beefy looking person with what appears to be silver hair and a very heavy looking weapon. That would obviously be Lans. Then short girl with big weapon, obviously Senna. These are very clearly to me, early, early versions of the main party, and if they gave us a founder party with these designs and personalities based on these designs and their weapons, then we're just going to be getting deja vu of the main game and not the good kind, so I don't even want the founders to look like this. With these proto party member designs in mind, though, we can actually go back to the proto city scene on page 163 and start to pick out which of the silhouettes is who. I'm fairly certain the person with two swords on their back is actually proto Noah, as if you look, the sword with the handle above their right shoulder and poking out below their left hip is very similar shaped on the two ends we can see to the Minato Rex, and if the character was holding it in that way, it would be on their back the exact same way that Shulk has it in Future Connected. Then the other sword pointing in the other direction is a lot slimmer looking and slightly shorter, and I'm guessing that this is what eventually evolved into Lucky Seven in its unsheathed form, and that the way Proto Noah handled having two swords was going to be a bit more like Corvin from Xenoblade 2's DLC, where he has one main weapon that he uses for most of his stuff, but also has the super powerful Forbidden One that he'll pull out if he really needs to, and they eventually decided to condense them into literally one weapon. Also, I think it's worth pointing out that these characters are wearing their weapons. Sure, the thing of them posing in front of the environment is just a kind of dramatic title screen-like thing, so that could be excused, but here, they're just kind of innocently standing around the city and the weapons are all attached to their backs, so it looks like this concept art predates the idea of Summon Old Blades. As for the other figures in the foreground, I can't make them out well enough to tell if there are any of these other proto-character designs or just kind of other blobs that might have eventually evolved into other characters. However, in the background, near the transport ship looking thing, we can see a few things. Next to the red thing below the ladder that sort of looks like a case of stuff, there are what I think are three figures. There's one that's right next to the ladder that I can't make out at all, but to the right of the cases, underneath the little flap thing on the ship and underneath the two characters with glowing weapons, there are two figures that very, very much look like Proto Lands and Proto Senna, just flipped because I think they're facing the camera, and completely silhouetted. Their relative heights and their weapon profiles match up, so I think that's who those characters are supposed to be. This might not literally be silhouettes of the exact same art of them we see later on on 172, but... I think that is who these characters are. As for the glowing weapon people on top of the ship, technically the one with the long blue thing could be Proto Mio or Proto Uni, but based on the build of the character and the weapon's shape, I believe this is Proto Mio. And while the character to the right of her does not have a build or weapon that remotely matches any of the six characters we see on 172, we will actually see a silhouette of this character again later on, so do keep them in mind. Pages 173 and 174 are all about the Pentalus region, and we're going to skip over the Maktha on 173, and instead be very depressed when looking at 174, because there are three images of the Orion Tunnels that are just as bright and colorful as actual Araya in Xenoblade 2 was, and not depressing and literally the ether mines from Xenoblade 1, as they are in 3, and that makes me very sad. At least we have the Lost Colony, but this is still kind of depressing. 175 is all about the intro, there are two images of the little town, and one of Alchemoth. Alchemoth, as we expected, looks virtually identical to how it does in Definitive Edition, just with a couple more towers added that are probably new pieces of technology or whatever, or used to make the city move to get closer to a cliff, because that is not how Alchemoth was in relation to any piece of land in Future Connected. The bottom piece of art of the town shows off something that, while it is visible in-game and as such canon, is a lot more obvious here. This specific street with all the stalls 
looks very, very similar to the street the Gem Man stall is in Colony 9 in Xenoblade 1, so it's possible that this town from the beginning of the game is actually a rebuilt Colony 9, and not a built-up Grandel like I had initially thought after my first playthrough. In addition to that, Fort Overbus, the little Keves castle town within Ionios, also very, very clearly uses some of the roadmap from Noah's town in the beginning and ending, so it seems like some of that made it into Ionios and then got changed into a fort over time, but that means that some small piece of Colony 9, the original Colony 9, is still present in Ionios, right next to where Melia should be ruling out of. There just happens to be another place actually called Colony 9 there, which I think is pretty funny. Speaking of Fort Overbus, the next page is all stuff about that. However, this stuff, the stuff about both of the castles and a lot of the city stuff that follows, is at least recognizably similar enough to the final game where I don't have anything to talk about, and we're going to skip all the way to page 187 where we get the Beta Founder Statues. It's very interesting because these three Founder Statues don't really resemble the final ones whatsoever, however, the scale figure there is Noah in nearly his final design, and this even appears to be a render of an unfinished version of his model, not even a 2D piece of art, so it looks like the final designs for a lot of the areas in the game were still being worked on when the character designs were nearly finalized. And since we vaguely know when the character designs were nearly finalized, that means that stuff like the Founder Statue's appearances weren't completely set in stone until like early to mid-2020, which I think is really neat because it shows just how much time a game like this takes to make. As for the statues themselves, here's where things get really wild. As far as I can tell, this concept piece is depicting what we know as the right side of the statue room when viewed from the entrance. This means we're looking at the three Kavesi statues, and from our left to right, that would be the founder of Doyle, the mentor slash father of the founder of Reed, and the founder of Ortiz. The one that seems the least changed out of all three of these is Doyle, as this is still clearly a woman with cat ears. However, instead of having an even shorter hairstyle than Final Game Mio has, this statue has a lot longer hair, much more resembling M's final hairstyle. She's also wearing what I think is a dress or a long robe, as opposed to the much more practical combat gear, a lot closer to modern Lost Numbers equipment that the Doyle statue has, so this is also a stark difference, and it's possible that some elements of this design made their way into either Nia's queen outfit, or the dress we see young Mio in in her concept art. To the right is Reed's mentor, and while this is still very clearly supposed to be Shulk, the way they aged him up in appearance for this is very different to what they did in the final game. The statue in-game gives him a longer hairstyle, more resembling Klaus, though with Shulk's trademark bang so you can still clearly tell it's him, gives him a sweater reminiscent of the one in his default outfit in base game Xenoblade 1, as well as a cloak that sort of looks like a lab coat, and a prosthetic right arm. This gives him the distinction of looking like both Dunban, his actual mentor figure, and Klaus, the guy whose footsteps he's sort of following in by being a scientist. This version of the statue is completely different. It mostly looks like what Shulk would look like in Future Connected 2, because his hairstyle is virtually identical to how it is in Definitive Edition, and the outfit he's wearing is very slick proto-lost numbers looking stuff as opposed to much more Xenoblade 1 aesthetic looking stuff, and while he does sort of have a cloak, it's really just a jacket that's partially draped over his shoulders. I very much prefer the design they used in the final game because not only is it a lot more symbolic and makes me a lot more emotional, I also think it looks a lot more like something Shulk would wear. This outfit in this statue looks a lot more like something Chaos from Xenosaga would wear, and well yes, they did reuse Chaos' design for Alvis in Xenoblade 1 and there's a connection there, Chaos looks like a 14 year old maximum and this is supposed to depict Shulk bare minimum mid-twenties, so I'm very glad they didn't go with this. The last statue is actually the most changed, that being the one of Ortiz. In the final game, this is a young-looking Homs boy that also bears some resemblance to Shulk based on the goggles and the outfit, but in this case, it seems like they did, like I said, reuse one of the beta party member designs for one of the founders because this appears to be very similar to the proto-uni design, in both appearance and outfit, so I am very interested in the thought process that led them to change this to a Homs boy instead of the Hyentia woman. If I had to make a completely blind guess, I'm thinking that maybe it was in part done to slightly balance out the gender ratio of the founders, as in the final game, the statues are 4 male to female, 
However, two of the male statues are just Shulk and Rex as mentors, and they both explicitly say that the real founders of Cassini and Reed were female, so the true count is four female to male, and if you agree that Nia is actually the seventh founder, that is five female to male. In this hypothetical concept art scenario, if we assume that the three statues we can't see in this picture were all the same gender they are in the final game, and that Nia is still the seventh founder, and that Shulk's mentee, the founder of Reed, is also a woman, then that would leave the founder of Van Damme as the only guy in this founders group, and Monolith has liked at least a relatively balanced gender ratio in all of the other Xeno games, so especially if they wanted the founders to be the DLC campaign, I'm not sure they'd go with that, so I can sort of see their reasoning for turning Ortiz into a guy. While we're talking about founder statues, I do want to bring up one other theory, and that is the final game's statue for House Rhodes. This is the only one of the statues to have a visible core crystal, and I actually think the Proto-Mio design, the silver-haired woman with the spear, eventually evolved into something that they decided to repurpose for this founder statue. This isn't really backed up by anything and is mostly pure guessing, but I think the waist-length braid of Proto-Mio could very easily have evolved into the relatively short ponytail that the statue has, especially since we've already seen Fei Fong Wong's hair get so much shorter when they made Noah's design based on his, and then there's the idea that if Proto-Uni was used for Ortiz, then they could have very easily used Proto-Mio for Rhodes, changed the design of Rhodes up a little bit, and then completely swapped Proto-Uni's design to a completely different character to even out the gender ratio. Also, the outfits that the Proto-Mio and Rhodes statues have are very similar, surprisingly. The biggest difference is that the Rhodes statue's top looks a bit more like an Agony and Offseer top, and we can't tell if the Rhodes statue is bare-legged or wearing leggings while Proto-Mio very clearly has them, and that's just because the statues are monochrome and not painted, and not because there isn't enough detail or anything. Last up on our tour of city concept art, and just the location section in general, is page 189, which is the last appearance of all of the funny silhouettes. This is visible in every picture on the top row, but I'm going to focus on the top right picture because that's by far the biggest and most obvious of the three. First off, the buildings in this proto version of the city are distinctly different from the final game. It looks more like a combination of the opening ending town and Toragoth than anything we actually see in the final game, and there's even a clock tower there which might have eventually evolved into the one where we can see time stopping at the beginning of the game. And in the lower right hand corner, we see three silhouettes. The first one is our old friend Two Sword Guy, and he's actually colored in a little bit, to the point where we can see the hole in the Monado Rex, confirming that that is in fact the sword he's holding. To the right is again Proto Mio, the girl with the lance, and then walking away from them is a guy that appears to be in long flowing robes and carrying a katana. This is the guy that was next to Proto Mio with the orange glowing sword so many pages ago. I'm gonna guess that he's a proto hero character, or just some weird 7th party member ally guy with a katana, and they eventually merged his samurai traits alongside the protagonist traits to make Noah, because there's really no character like this whatsoever in the final game besides N, and he does sort of look like he's wearing something close to N's armor, so they might have repurposed some of his clothes for N, and then the samurai idea for Noah. Also, his weapon glows orange in that other picture, so they probably repurposed that idea and just kind of the orange glowing curved sword for one of the generic Agnian weapons. Mercifully for my voice, we're going to be skipping several pages all the way to 210. What we're passing over is the Cloud Keep concept art and the majority of the weapons section. While the art in here is very cool, there's not really a lot to talk about because, for the most part, it is just concept art for the final designs of all of the different characters' weapons. You got all the party members, all the heroes, a bunch of different enemies, including some Mobius, and then the generic Kavessian Agnian soldier weapons. 210, though, is different. It contains both of X's weapons, her scythe and the staff she got from Zed, as well as M's Mobius version of her rings, Dirk, that is, pre-Mobius's claws, and then both of the Lucky Sevens we see. This is visible in-game, but it's much more noticeable here, so I'm going to talk about it here. But this is one of the many reasons why I think the theory that there is only one Lucky Seven makes no sense, and that is, it is very, very clear that N's weapon and Noah's weapon are completely differently shaped. The handle is the same, and the general outline is the same, but the hilt is completely different, and even the blade is slightly different shaped. It's not just a recolor, it is a completely different weapon. Keep in mind, 
that there are side quests where the characters can get their weapons powered up by most of the same Nopon who forged Lucky 7, allegedly, in the first place, and the only thing they can do is use Origin Metal to power up the character's regular, non-Origin Metal blades, not do anything to Lucky 7. So, I don't even think it's possible to reforge a weapon made out of Origin Metal. Basically, there is more than one Lucky 7. That theory brings up one interesting thing about the Noah that became N leaving his weapon behind when he passes away, but there are much better explanations for everything else we see regarding the sword. Speaking of that though, this is something not connected to that theory but also kind of interesting, as the next page also shows off N's powered up Sword of the N Sword of Origin form of his weapon, and they actually use Noah Ouroboros' sword there as well as a reference, and you can see that the proportions are also significantly different beyond just Noah's being much larger because it's an Ouroboros weapon as opposed to a weapon a human-sized person is wielding. Now, these powered-up forms appear to just be energy constructs around the base origin metal swords, so the fact that they look different is not an indication that they're using two different base swords. The fact that the base swords look different is an indication of that. I just think it's neat to get a slight bit of insight into the thought process behind how they were going to tweak the design they already had for Noah's when they were making ends, because based on the fact that Noah's completed one appears alongside ends, and this is later in the book, I'm assuming they did finish that stuff first. Related to this, but not actually in the art book, one of the many things undocumented in the latest Xenoblade 3 patch was the cutscene where Zed talks to N after he gets repaired and before the party confronts him in Origin. Initially, in that scene, he was wielding just the Black Lucky 7, and that was stuck into the ground in front of him. However, the updated scene has it in its more powerful Sword of the End state that he fights you with in the final battle against him, so we obviously knew that that conversation was when Zed sent him to go fight the party again and gave him that power-up, they just now directly show that his sword has been boosted in that conversation, just to make it a little more obvious. This does not change the story, or any theorizing, or any lore, it just makes something slightly more clear. So, objectively good change, I would have loved to know about it in the actual patch notes. This now brings us to the objects section, and here there really isn't a lot to talk about because it's just concept art of objects. It's great art and I love looking at it, but most of this stuff is one-to-one -one represented in the final game, so there's not really a lot to analyze. First thing I think is worth talking about is on page 219, where we can see something sort of resembling a cradle, and the person coming out of it appears to be wearing the Colony Zero plug suit. Except, in the one little picture where the door is opening from the side, we can see that the door is actually Zohar shaped. I don't know if that was intentional, but there's another Zohar that's not in the final game. On page 227, we see the Remembrance Stones from the city, and alongside a tree, there are three really weird-looking installations. There's a cone with grooves in it, there's a human hand reaching out of a tangle of metal, and then there's just a big tangle of metal. I'm not sure what any of those mean. I'm probably very stupid and they all show up in the game somewhere, but those are really weird in comparison to the relatively mundane by Xenoblade standards stuff within a couple pages of it. On the next page, 228, we can see concept art for a Toragonda. There are a few of these in the city, as that's basically the only place where traditional culture exists, so that is a prominent instrument people play, but it wasn't until looking at this concept art that it looks a lot more like the instrument from Ursula's side quest in Xenoblade 2 than I thought, so this probably came from the Agnian side of things. On page 229, we get a bunch of paintings that appear in-game. The backdrop is the painting of Guernica and Shania's father that she paints in a flashback in Senna's side story, or the Shania show, basically. On the bottom left is the painting of Consul K that you can see in one side quest. And the bottom right is the family painting of all of the siblings from the Colony Zero quest chain. There is nothing to indicate whether or not this has any significance other than to the Colony Zero chain and to the idea that Mobius is trying to wipe out things like family. And then in the bottom middle is an a adorable painting of Fiona that is unfortunately not present in the final game, despite there being a side quest where the same person who paints the portrait of Consul K actually paints one of her. I think it's a very missed opportunity that we can't actually see that in game, but at least it's here and we can look at it and we can all try to resist our desire to squish her little hair bun because it looks very poofy. In the top right hand corner of page 231, there is a small gray box that contains three things that all look like core crystals, with the one on the left literally being how core crystals look like in 2. 
these are not used at all in the final game. They're just referenced, so that's really interesting. I wonder what those would have been used for. On page 234, in the upper left-hand corner, we can see the Mobius chest knockoff thing that they're playing in that one cutscene, and this is really neat because it shows the only potential indication that Yuni and Mio's weapon classes are actually not unique and only held by them in the entirety of Ionios. While the top piece is only holding a very generic sword, the second piece appears to be wielding Yuni's gunrod both in Kavesi and Agnian versions, which means that there are apparently Agnian soldiers wielding a high Antia based weapon, and then the bottom one is in both Kavesi and Agnian variants wielding Mio's twin rings, which means the weapon type that's literally a weapon class in Xenoblade 2 is apparently accessible by the Kavesi side. Really interesting, in all honesty. This also means that with Yuni and Mio accounted for here, we have knowledge that Lanz's weapon is apparently just a souped up version of a very generic Kevis blocking weapon. We know that Noah's sword is literally a generic Kevesi sword, but painted red and with Lucky 7 in it, and that at the very least Nimue is also capable of using Tyon's Mondo, which means Senna is actually the only one of the party members to potentially have a completely unique weapon type. The next section is another one that's very easy on me because it is storyboards, and while these are also great and I love looking at them and seeing the creative process behind this stuff, it's just nine pages of storyboards of the final battle of chapter three, so there's not really anything I can talk about whatsoever. Then finally, we reach probably the biggest, the eight pages of spoiler stuff, and this starts really big because right off the bat, page 250 is Melia and 251 is Nia. The Melia page, I think, has a lot more interesting stuff in it, though, as there is one picture of her with a veil thing on her head that she doesn't wear in the full game, as well as one of her with a veil over the mask, suggesting that that was going to be part of her design, but was eventually scrapped. Then more extremely unintentional wholesomeness, because they do the exact same thing they did for Yuni, where they have her one wing extended to show what it looks like on the inside when it's not scrunched up, and I love the fact that it's the exact same blocking for both of them. I know this is basically just a standardized thing for concept art, but... It's just another really cute connection between the two of them, and well, I don't think they're as closely related or related at all like Nia and Mio very obviously are, I love the couple interactions between the two of them we see, and Yuni's she's just like me for real for real moment where she realizes that Melia is like the only other person in the world with wings the size of hers is just really adorable and endearing, and I love seeing more stuff of them just being similar in ways despite the fact that they're not related and complete polar opposites in terms of personality. The biggest thing about the Melia page, though, is the piece of concept art of her bedroom in the top right corner. Now, we can access this as a location, either by using some very funny jumping strats or just by unlocking Melia as a hero in the post-game, and in the ending cutscene, we can see that the painting in her room has Shulk's Monado Replica EX Plus from Future Connected behind it. However, while the painting is scrolled up in this picture, that's Noah's sword there. What does that mean? I think the running theory is that the Monado Rex Plus and Noah's weapons design were swapped at some point in development because we know Future Connected and Definitive Edition at large, of course, and Xenoblade 3 were being worked on at the same time and even partially at the same time as the end of development of Torna, which must have been really wild in the Monolith offices for a couple months there. And that kind of makes sense. That also sort of goes with the fact that Proto Noah also has the Rex Plus, which based on its design, would not have been able to have a second sword inside it, which also makes the fact that he's carrying two swords if one of them is a proto-lucky seven make more sense. And while I think that's the most plausible theory, and they gave the Rex Plus design to Future Connected because it's a lot more shaped similarly to Shulk's initial Monado 1, while Noah's weapon's final design has two edges and looks a bit more different and could be seen as a much more future evolution for a much more distant future sequel, I like the conspiracy theory that they just put the wrong sword in there, and Proto Noah having the Rex Plus was either a placeholder for when that sword's design was finalized, or the way in which Xenoblade 3 was a sequel to 1 and 2 was initially very different, and the main character, instead of having a unique sword that called back to Replica Monados, literally would have inherited or found the Rex Plus in some way, and while well, yeah, we are clearly going to see the Rex Plus in the DLC at some point because it's in the key art for it, and it could very well have to do with a Founder story, I just think it would be in the hands of actual Shulk and not some other guy. I think that taking this concept as a beta version of Xenoblade 3's party is a great jumping off point for 
fan fiction or some other speculative thing. Do an alternate universe version of Xenoblade 3 where it's a much more traditional direct combined sequel to 1 and 2 and pick up on that premise with those character designs and basic concept and with the added wrinkle that some guy from the Xenoblade 1 world, even better make him not a descendant of anyone important or even know who Shulk was, getting his hands on Shulk's original weapon and how the world and people who are old and or knowledgeable enough to actually know about Shulk or possibly have known Shulk would respond to that and basically take things from there. All of that fills me with so much inspiration, however, I'm kind of bad at writing, so that much I'll leave as an exercise to the viewer. Nia's page is unfortunately a bit less exciting, but there are two things. First, thighs, and second, there's a little thumbnail of her controlling the Agnes Castle mech, and there was one of Melia controlling the Keves one next to the bedroom. And interestingly, we can see that it seems like Poppy was supposed to come out of the little information hole a bit faster than she does in the final game, because if you zoom in really close and see some splotches of color there, you can see her floating in the air, it looks like she's providing power to the mech above Nia's head, and that's adorable. I do think I agree with the way she was used in the final game, but that would have been amazing and I would have loved to see that as well. On the next page, we're met with a very nice surprise, and that is full body official art for console M. We did have art for N, and that was posted on, like, the Japanese official website and probably was tweeted out by a bunch of different Nintendo branches, but I don't think anyone really expected M to get something, let alone one where her mask is off. The rest of the page is just regular Saito concept stuff for her, and the page across from that is one for N. Interestingly, the picture that shows his full long hair has him with a turtleneck sweater-like thing, like the outfit that the concept images of young Noah and Yuni were wearing, so maybe N is wearing a Kavesi military issue turtleneck underneath his console armor? That's really funny to think about. And then also we can see his official art. Like I said, this had been posted publicly before, but this is the variation without the mask, so it is new content still. We are rapidly approaching the end of the video. There's like six pages left in the book, and I only really want to talk about maybe two or three, but I'm going to do a little bit of skipping. We're going to pass over 256 for the time being, because that's got the really weird stuff and I'm saving that for last. We're going to do 258 now, because the one square picture in the middle is the only one I really want to talk about, and that is concept art of Melia in captivity. The only really interesting thing here is it looks like her arms are down in this concept image, and they righted a very grievous wrong in the final game by making her actually crucified, it would have been a disgrace to the Zeno series if they didn't have someone get crucified in this game, so I'm glad they rectified that. The last remaining page of art after that, 259, is just some inner origin stuff, so not really a lot to talk about. 257 is the amphitheater, and I really like the lighting that's in these images, but other than that, it's basically the amphitheater as it is in the final game, so not really a lot to talk about here. And before we do 256, I'm going to be really rude and talk about one more piece of art, and that is the piece that's on the back of the special edition box. At, at first glance, you might think we've talked about this picture already, but this is actually a different one of Oriya in the exact same positioning. The painting style is different, the Makana sword is there, if you look to the left of Oriya, you can see what looks like Great Kate Falls, and again, a not representative of the final game, Aerith style hovering reef, and then also, well, you know, the party members are there, that's probably a big deal. These silhouettes are really blotchy and undefined, but you can clearly tell that these are at least somewhat representative of the final versions of the characters, besides the one random Nopon doing a headstand that appears to have no defining features in place of both Riku and Manana. My best guess is that this was some sort of design intermediary between the six completely different looking proto-party members that we've seen a lot of places before, and the final designs. So, the developers in-house at Monolith had decided, okay, this is what Uni is going to look like. Noah is going to wear a jacket and have a ponytail and be roughly this tall compared to other characters. But they hadn't gotten finalized or close to finalized designs from Saito, so they used very blobby looking silhouettes. And you could see a lot of inconsistencies, largely in hair and clothes, between these characters and how they appear in the final game. That being said, I don't think the rest of the art was created at the same time. That is, very far into development when they had finalized their ideas for what the characters would look like, which I think would be probably mid to late 2019. I have a sneaking suspicion that this is the original proof of concept piece for what eventually turned in to Xenoblade 3, 
but with things representative of the final party members edited in probably years later. If you think about it, we know as a fact that the visual of the Makana Sword seemingly piercing the Orion Titan had been thought of prior to Xenoblade 2 even releasing. And yet, this is the only piece of art depicting both the Orion Titan and the Makana Sword in the entire special edition. The only other place you will see that is on the case of the game itself if you put your game case in the special edition. Obviously, there's nothing directly confirming this, but the fact that we haven't seen any other concept art of this, sure, they could be saving it, possibly it could spoil something they reused for the DLC, or they just want that in the full art book later on, but if this is the only concept piece of the key image of Xenoblade 3 that we've seen, then I think it's not too unreasonable to assume it was the concept piece that made Xenoblade 3 what it is. All right, we have to talk about the big funny references. Let's go to page 256. This is a lot of origin related stuff and I'm gonna talk about every image here, but I'm gonna talk about the ones that aren't really important first. The first one is just the outside of origin, the big square thing on the top right. Not really a lot to talk about here. That sure is what the outside of origin looks like in the final game. Next, we're gonna go bottom left, a weird cyberspace looking thing. I really don't know what to say about this one. It's just the inside of origin, but different looking than how they rendered it in the final game. That's neat. Above and to the left of that, we have another sort of weird cyberspace looking thing, but this one looks a little bit more like some representations of memory and the worlds merging in that weird space stuff that we've seen before, so this is a bit closer to the final game, and the color scheme also looks a lot like the menus, so this might have been where they got that color palette from. Then we'll go all the way to the top left, where we can see what appears to be the amphitheater, but instead of purple stuff and core crystals, we can see giant yellow monoliths surrounding it in massive rows. And then if we go to the bottom right of that, we can see even more of them and get a better look at them, and those are the save icons from Xenogears. Oh, and by the way, that's not just a cheeky memory storage joke. They did canonically store memories and information about people in-universe. So apparently, at least at one point in time, their explanation for how Origin stored people was... play Xenogears. And while you should all play Xenogears, or at least watch a playthrough if you can't, I think it was a good idea for them to change it to Core Crystals, honestly. Yeah, the reference is great, but A, it's not like there aren't plenty of other Gears references elsewhere in the game, and B, just pure accessibility. Xenoblade 3 is already supposed to be the culmination of the series that's come before it, which means you also have to play the other two numbered Xenoblade games, which are also massively long games, and that's just the ones on the Switch. They wanted to make 3 able to stand on its own, apart not just from the other Xeno games, but also from the other Xenoblade games. And yeah, I do think 3 is fully playable and understandable at the very least, without having played 1 and 2. And I think it's a good idea to not have things in your big Xenoblade celebration that is also supposed to be a good entry point for new players, to be bogged down by needing to understand a reference to a game that's 25 years old next year, and completely inaccessible legally on any platform newer than the PlayStation 3. Basically, if you're going to make the explanation for how Origin stored people a reference in the environmental design of the area, it's much better to have it be a Xenoblade 2 reference, one of the games you already absolutely need to play to fully understand the rest of 3, than a Xenogears reference, a game whose concepts are almost completely revisited across both 2 and 3. In fact, you can even see basically the exact same shot of the inside of Origin, but with the Xenogears memory cubes replaced with core crystals, to the lower right of the image we've been looking at. And then, you look in the lower right hand corner and everyone loses their mind! So first off, this, based on the rest of the page, is apparently the interior of Origin. Second off though, the platforms in here don't really resemble anything else we see in either this page or the final game's version of Origin. Like, the Xenogears memory thing and the core crystal thing, they both show the amphitheater from the top, and it does look very similar to how it does in the final game, if not identical, but none of the platforms here look like they could be the amphitheater. 
they look completely metallic, so they probably aren't supposed to be that in the first place, and the one slightly to the bottom right of the middle almost looks more like a weird flat spaceship than anything you'd stand on top of. Then there's also the fact that there's this weird eye-shaped nebula in the background behind all of the Zohars. The plane the spaceship thing is floating above appears slightly curved, so is it supposed to be the surface of a planet or star or something? And then, the partially cut off Zohar in the top left corner is very clearly supposed to be the Xenosaga Zohar. It's got the right coloration and the design is almost identical. However, the ones in the background might look more like the Xenosaga Zohar emulators, which are pretty much exactly what it says on the tin. They're man-made devices meant to emulate the Zohar's function and powers and can be used in lesser capacity to do similar things that you could do with it. And the main difference design-wise is that the main Zohar has a slightly more ornate design and a big turquoise jewel in the center of the cross bit, while the emulators are a bit simpler in design, and instead of the jewel, they just have a different Hebrew letter for each of the different emulators. Long before the art book came out, people had been theorizing, including me, that Origin's function was somehow the Xenoblade equivalent to a Zohar emulator, despite the fact that its capabilities seemed like they could only be matched by the Zohar itself, but that's way beside the point. And it seems like this at least somewhat backs up the theory where the developers were thinking of the Zohar, specifically the Xenosaga version, the one that had emulators made, in origin in some capacity. That being said, I don't know if this picture actually depicts a scrapped version of Origin's interior. This could just be some other mostly unrelated concept piece that they stuck on the Origin page because they had an empty space and it sort of looked like it fit with them. Remember, Tora wearing a thong is included within Ricky's outfit art in the Xenoblade Definitive Edition art book, so we really can't tell for sure. I say this, and yet, I do think this is connected to Origin somehow. I'm not entirely sold on the idea that the interior of Origin looked like this weird nebula-y void with Zohars floating around in it, but I think that at the very least this would have been a vision granted by Origin, possibly a much different, much higher budget and therefore less likely to be made version of the scene where Nia explains how the worlds combined, how the multiverse works, and how Mobius came into existence. I think a very neat way to depict the multiverse would be each universe has its own different Zohar that represents it, and it just so happens that there's something that looks like the Xenosaga one floating out there. You don't have to acknowledge that it's from Xenosaga, but someone who knows will know, hey, it's technically in the same multiverse now, and then you have the Xenoblade 1 and 2 worlds represented by the Conduit, which is basically just the shiny cross thing that doesn't have any details on its surface or anything. I've also seen the theory that since the Zohars in the background appear less detailed, they might actually be like the Xenosaga Zohar emulators and have less detail intentionally and maybe a letter instead of a jewel on them, but I'm going to chalk this up to this being an illustration, so the person making it has good reason to put less detail on the things in the background, because that really just makes more sense to me than them actually going whole hog and straight up putting the entire Xenosaga Zohar functioning basically unchanged from its parent game in there, especially since the Conduit already has a few visual and functional differences. Unfortunately, despite this probably being the one most interesting image in here, the fact that we have zero context for it and it doesn't really fit alongside all the stuff it's with means I can't really tell you exactly what it was for, and I can really just speculate and that speculation is only going to get worse the longer I go. This is another one of those things that gives me so much inspiration and so many ideas that I don't really know where to start with it, and this, out of any of the unused ideas, is one I hope they revisit in the future. However, that's the entire video. I've already been talking for like four times as much as I should have, and thank you so much for watching if you made it this far. Do the usual liking, commenting, and subscribing, because, you know, you should do that if you like the video. You made it through an hour and 40 minutes, so I hope you like my content at this point, and it really helps me a lot, especially when I don't do anything for like two and a half to three weeks and then come up with something an hour and 45 minutes long that people are not very likely to click on, because why would you? But yeah, these end slates are never structured or scripted, so I'm always basically just talking, and I'm pretty sure I have basically just talking enough now, so thank you also to all the patrons whose names you have been seeing on screen. 
for both your support and your patience because, you know, the people who pay me for videos and stuff are the most affected by when I don't make videos. And yeah, I don't know. I'm running out of words. Until next time, this is Luxon signing off. Next video will be shorter and I need a throat lozenge. Goodbye.